And we are live. Thank you for joining us for the Inner Strength Empowerment Hour. This is episode 32. I am Lori DePietro Standin here with my two amazing success coaches, LT and Joanne, and our special guest, Brittany, who is a client of mine. And today we are going to be talking about the third agreement. So as you know, or I hope you know, we've been doing a series on the four agreements. This is a book by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's about 25 years old. And uh, it's something that it's, it's almost like a group of essays. It's a really short book. And uh, they're just sort of rules to live by. And you don't have to look at it if you are, he talks a lot in the book about the Toltec religion and things like that, or, or maybe not talks about it a lot, but refers to it. Um, but this really isn't, it doesn't have to be any kind of religious thing. These are just tenets to live by. Uh, so uh, these have, have been, this is a book that's known all over the world. It's been helpful to so many people. And so we are excited to dig into the third agreement and talk about not making assumptions. So this really goes along with the second agreement, which is don't take things personally. So the first agreement is be impeccable with your word. The second agreement is don't take things personally. Third agreement, don't make assumptions. So I wanted to um, talk to Brittany first about her experience, uh, both in my program and how it relates to this agreement, because she has a has has given this a thought, some thought, and has a lot to say on this subject. So, um, Brittany, if you could, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself first? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I am a financial consultant. I work um, with clients. I enjoy running and gardening and cooking and eating. Um, <laughs> turning 32 next week, so that's right. exciting. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, this will be good. So what was your thinking like when you, before you joined my program? And how much, what was your physicality like as well? How much extra weight were you carrying? What kind of problems were you having? Yeah, so... I was carrying maybe around 25 or so extra pounds and I knew I had some conflict inside of me that I didn't fully realize until I started to go a little bit deeper, but I, I can remember back to, and I joined the program over two years ago, but I can think back and remember waking up on many occasions deciding, okay, today's the day that I'm going to change and, um, you know, starting to feel guilt around knowing that I wasn't treating myself, my body, um, doing the right things uh, for myself. And one right. of the things I realized, um, not back then, but as I started in this process, is that I wasn't really paying attention to how I felt or what I needed. I was just kind of trying to achieve, you know, whatever goal made sense at the time in my life. And so there was it was a struggle for me to figure out how to actually pay attention and listen to my feelings and, and just kind of use that as a way to, to find my why. What do you think, if you, if you had to guess, or maybe you've thought about this part, what, it, what made you get to the point where you weren't acknowledging your feelings about things? Where, where do you think that comes from? That's a really good question. <laughs> I didn't, put, I, I know I didn't tell you ahead of time that I was going to ask that, but it just made me think as you were talking, because I think a lot of women feel that way. They, they really lose touch with themselves over time to the point where if you ask them how they feel about things, it's a struggle for them to answer. Yeah, I don't know how I got to that point or how that became the default. And maybe it's just something that I've never been taught how to deal with. And I've always just felt like I can, I can handle things on my own and I was supposed to be able to handle things on my own. And so I never really, like I wasn't ever in a relationship where somebody would ask me those questions to kind of make me think deeper in that area. So I don't, I don't know if it wasn't like trauma or anything in particular, right. but um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So just it's something that maybe, maybe learned behavior um, from society or from your family 
I, I mean, I think that's true for a lot of us. Yeah. So um, what, what do you think was in your mindset itself? What do you feel besides not tuning into yourself? What do you feel was making you self-sabotage? I think it was just resistance that I was having that I didn't recognize. And so yeah. maybe a little bit of being afraid of, you know, improvement or afraid of success or afraid of failure even just mm -hmm. kind of made me not pay attention to things the way that I should. So yeah, I think just learning to tune in, like you said, is yeah. really important. And it just took me I mean, basically my whole life up until now to figure out that that's something I need to do if I want to continue to improve. And just for people listening, um, that is what we work on in my program. So it is, uh, I always call it a self-development program with a side of weight loss. <laughs> Um, because we really do work on getting to the root of the problem. Because I know from my experience, um, losing 60 pounds, that it wasn't just, oh, now I know what to eat. And so I'm going to do all the right things. It, it was a, a mental, emotional process. Um, and I was unloading emotional weight as I was unloading the physical weight. Um, and, and learning more about myself and embracing that. And so those things can be challenging, uh, but that's why this is a, a lifetime program. So Brittany has been with us for two years and some of these things, um, you know, you have just come more to a point recently, even though you lost all of your weight towards the beginning, right? Yeah. So what, um, what do you think in the four agreements, so we, we've we been studying uh, that in our group as well before we started doing it here. Um, I know that not making assumptions was something that really, you know, that stuck out to you. What about it made you think, like what parts of your life did that affect and you felt like it applied to? Yeah, I thought it was interesting when LT asked me to talk about that agreement. And I actually hadn't read the chapter yet when she asked me <laughs> I to it. So I was like, this is going to be interesting. Um, and in my job, I mean, my job is in a sense to make assumptions, you know, about rates of return and life expectancy and all kinds of different things. And so I'm, initially I had some resistance about whether I was even going to be able to relate to this or, you know, understand what, what we were trying to do here. And but then when I read it, it was weird because it felt like it just completely related to what was going on in my life with my job. And it was like, it was written about that. And I was like, wow, this is really weird. This is so relevant to me. Um, but I think, you know, it's not necessarily that assumptions are bad. It's more about the type of assumptions that we make and the lack of understanding that we have about where these assumptions are coming from. So in the book, they talk about how, you know, we're brought up in this world and we don't really realize that the different things that have an effect on us, how we're raised, beliefs of our parents, all of these things. And I think once you start to realize that you're making assumptions, it's just this thing that keeps happening over and over again. And I, I mean, even in my job, I've been saying every other week, you know, this is why we don't make assumptions. And in my interactions with clients, um, you know, when I go in for a presentation, for example, you know, prior to this agreement, I was making all kinds of assumptions about what I thought they would think about what I was going to talk about, whether I thought they were going to agree with it. And going in with that mindset, and in, in my mind, now that I look back on it, you're kind of almost securing that result because the way that you talk about something, you know, depending on what you think the outcome is, is going to affect that outcome. Yeah. And now I'm trying to focus on, especially, you know, in interactions with clients and people and relationships, just kind of stepping back and just letting it be a more natural conversation and really just listening and understanding. And then you have just a lot more authentic results. You know, he talks in the book about how um, assumptions make us feel safe. 
because it's our comfort zone. We like to have a confirmation bias. So we assume things that it align with our comfort zone. Um, and so I think that is so interesting to not just talk about, you know, don't make assumptions based on, you know, what society thinks or what your parents thought or anything like that, but also what makes you comfortable and how you can actually sabotage yourself by just having a confirmation bias and wanting to believe things or see things the way that is most comfortable for you instead of the way they are. And I, I just, I think that's fascinating because I think with women, and maybe you can speak to this because in your position in the business world, I know that even, it, you know, in, in many industries, it's male dominated. Um, but you know, as women, we, part of making assumptions that makes us feel safe is that we don't have the courage to, or, or we have a hard time speaking up for ourselves and asking the hard questions. Do you think that that is something that you've seen or experienced in your line of work? Not in particular. I mean, it is very male dominated and I am one of the few women, but I think I was brought up in the, in the mindset where my mom didn't treat me any different for being a girl. And I'm really grateful for that because, yeah. you know, several years back, I realized that most of the time I'm the only female in the room when we're having, you know, a group meeting. And I never really even thought much of that. And so maybe that was a positive assumption that I was brought up under, you know, most most women are kind of brought up with you're different, you know, you have to be a certain way. Um, you, you know, you can't be more assertive, but luckily for me, I, I wasn't brought up that way. So I don't, I don't really resonate as much with that. I mean, I can see it, but um, yeah. that's something I'm really grateful that my parents, you know, treated me the same as my brothers. Yeah. Strong, strong women bringing up strong women, right? Yeah. Um, so how are you feeling now mentally and physically? What are, what is the, the difference that you've seen in yourself as you've come to these realizations? Yeah, I mean, I feel great um, physically better than I've ever felt before. And it's interesting because it, it works itself into every aspect of your life. So, you know, once you start working on your mindset and, and asking yourself what you need and, and, you know, talk, figuring out what your vision is and aligning what you're doing to that vision, your goals just keep getting bigger and bigger and, and you start to believe, and this is where I think the assumption thing is interesting because I don't think all assumptions are bad. I think we should default to positive assumptions about what we can do and what we can achieve. And this whole process has taught me that I can do a lot more than I thought that I could before. And then just even as I go every day, I can see more and more opportunities and even just what I'm willing to agree to do. So two years ago, I would have never agreed to come on the show and talk <laughs> about this. But now that I'm, you know, getting to that point in my own mind, I'm more open and more comfortable. And I, I, I find less stress in my life because of it. Mm -hmm. It's, I think a process of, um, becoming more comfortable with who you are because you know yourself so much better and because you can navigate in the world in a way that feels empowered. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, it's, you know, a long, 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 long time ago, before I ever read this book, somebody said to me that I needed to assume love because I was always assuming people's motives were against me. You know, I was always assuming the worst without knowing any facts at all. That, that was just my default motive, but it was a defense mechanism mm -hmm. because I wanted to protect myself. So I would assume the worst just in case it was the worst. But like you said, <clears throat> that makes you act accordingly. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when you do that um, in many ways. So it, it does, you know, when you assume love, sometimes you're wrong, but most of the time not. So that's the really cool thing is like you said, it really, what it does is open up opportunities for you to have a positive impact and to be a happier person for sure. Um, so what advice would you give other women who are struggling in the areas you were struggling in before you started the program? 
Yeah, I mean, I think people that are listening to this, there's a reason for that. And I think we need to not take that sort of thing for granted in our lives when something, you know, comes into your environment and, and brings its attention to you, that there's a reason for that. And there's so much that you can do that you don't realize that you're capable of. And the first step in that is really just understanding yourself and what you want and what your vision is and really just trying not to lose sight of that. And so, you know, this program has been so great. I mean, obviously everyone kind of comes into this for the weight loss aspect, but that's just one minor component. Um, you know, once you kind of start to have little successes with, you know, losing a couple of pounds a week and, you know, starting to realize that you're capable of a lot of things you didn't think you were capable of, then it just spills over in all the areas of your life and you just become more confident, more comfortable, more relaxed, happier. And it's just like you keep leveling up as time goes on. Yeah, it's like a domino <laughs> effect in the rest of your life. Um, so yeah, that that is very cool. Well, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you had to... Um, possibly scoot out of a meeting to get to do this. So we really <laughs> appreciate that. Um, I know that, like you said, that, you know, because you're here, someone needed to hear what you had to say. Yeah. So we, we really appreciate that. And um, we'll see you in the group. So yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Bye. So, um, yeah, Brittany, that, you know, she's been, she was so quiet when she first joined the group. Um, and now she's just so much more vocal, so much more herself, like more of a presence. And so in addition to uh, losing the weight, if you, um, I'll, I'll try to post her before and after, unless one of you guys can find it. Um, but it's, you know, she's lost a significant amount of weight and um, she's actually in the process too, started uh, doing yoga and became a runner mm -hmm. and just her whole life is different. So it's, it's a very cool thing. So we appreciate having her on. So I, what about um, for, for you guys, I'm wondering, you know, how this particular agreement has impacted you. So what do you think your, um, your stance on assumptions or how you were handling that was before you started the program or before you started reading this book um, that you know had a chance to think about it more. Where do you think that that was causing you some issues? Go ahead, LT. Yeah, my, I was making assumptions that it was not gonna work for me, my other programs that I had been on, that I was going to fail at something, that I was not good enough. It was always internal, my assumptions. And I also put a lot of stock into other people that they were going to meet my expectations on certain things. Yeah. And I have come to discover very quickly, and I, I mean, I adopt this all the way down to my toes, that I'm the one who is in control of my own life. I am my best advocate. I am the one who's driving the bus. I, I can control a lot. And that's my thoughts, my words, and my deeds. And I'm not giving that power away to somebody else. I'm owning that power and making that shift has made all the difference. And not only in this weight loss journey, but in my life in general. Mm -hmm. So I, so you said, you know, which I think a lot of people feel this way because they failed at, or so I want to say failed because I don't think if a program is not designed to succeed long term, mm -hmm. that's not your failure. So I, right. I just want to put that out there because most of the things that are out there are just designed to be quick fixes. Yeah. But we feel like we failed. And I did many, many diets like everybody else. Um, maybe not as many as you, Lori, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I did 26, everybody. Yeah, and so I, I did feel like a failure and I did feel like that um, I felt like that I was definitely short lived with it because I threw in the towel very quickly. So I, I imposed that on myself. Yeah. I, I totally thought that about myself. 
-hmm. And then in, but the assumption that you were making in your personal life was that other people are here to make me happy or other people are supposed to make me happy. That's right. I, it's not me, you know, or maybe not so clearly in your head, but that's kind of the way that it played out. Yeah. And I think that's true for so many of us that we are, I see women living vicariously through their kids, you know, just what being in relationships that are bad because they keep wanting this person to do something to make them happy, you know, so there's, there's so many ways that this plays out. What about you, Joanne? How do you, what, what is your take on, on this in terms of how you were handling this or feeling before? It's pretty much the same. Like LT said, all my assumptions were based on that I thought other people would make me happy because I was sort of micromanaging everybody else. And I, I was seeing to it that they were happy. So I assumed that's how it worked. I assumed I do all these things for you. You in turn do all these things for me. And that was just spinning my wheels and making me crazy because it doesn't work that way because they weren't returning that. I expected that. That was my expectation and my assumption. And I think it was because I I just didn't believe in myself. I didn't believe in myself to make me happy. So I trusted that other people would make me happy. And don't you think, I think that that's a societal thing as well. Mm -hmm. Because you're raised to think, okay, the thing that's going to make you happy is getting married and having kids and having, you know, like there's things that, you know, maybe it's not, be, maybe for somebody listening, it wasn't being married and having kids, but maybe it's your career is going to make you happy. And so there's, but it's external. Yeah. yeah. That's, and I always had that vision that you do this, you do that. And, and it's a, it's a series of steps. And if you, yeah. if you miss, and it really bothered me because right after high school, I didn't go right away to college. And a lot of my friends did. I mean, some of them didn't, obviously everybody does their own thing, but the ones that did, and I didn't, I assumed that, that my whole life was going to be ruined because I didn't follow the steps. And then right after college, you have to get married if you're dating somebody. Like I just assumed that all these things had to happen to make me happy. And, and I think it was just because I was fearful that I would be missing a step or, you know, something mm-hmm. like that, that I thought everybody else did. So I had to do it and make it look exactly the same. That's exactly what I did. And I'll tell you what, I followed all the steps in perfect order. And then I got the college degree, got married, got the house, then was able to, to be a mom and be a stay at home mom and thought everything was going to be great and glorious. And I tell you, I fell flat on my face with postpartum depression that took me by complete surprise. And I mean, life and that was my son will be 22 on Monday. And that just really threw me for the biggest loop you've ever seen in your life. And things were never the same after that right. and still are not because I did mean that that was a very harrowing time for me. So yeah, I had lived my life with that assumption until that life hit me in the face like that. I think because the three of us all have teenagers, we'll see what you guys think about this, but I think that with my youngest, my son is 17 and he, I'm seeing this backlash of this generation yep. saying, we don't want to do things yep. in order. We don't exactly. want to perform. <laughs> oh, it's so refreshing to me. Like right. I am That's just there like, yes, go do what you, I've had so many conversations <laughs> with my daughters about that exact thing because I don't, I mean, I have not brought my girls up to think that way. We're all about girl power. We're all about do what you want, but there must be something in her mind from little on when I wasn't like thinking this way, that she's under the assumption that if she doesn't get it right, she's not going to be happy. And we had a huge conversation about her. Like she thinks she has to do this, then go to college, then get the job. And she has a lot of fear about well, if I do all these things, then I'm going to be stuck in a job. And I'm not, what if I don't like it? What if I'm miserable? What if that's not the job? And I was like, listen, sister, you don't (laughs) have to do that. Do what you want to do. This whole society is set up to make you think you go to high school, you go to college, you get the job, you get the house. I'm like, your life doesn't have to look like that at all. If you want to say, screw it all and just go live in the jungle. That's what I want you to do. You know, like, don't think you have to make it look like they're telling you it has to look. 
Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I think maybe the hardships that I have had gave me an advantage in that area mm -hmm. um, because I have not lived that way. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I got pregnant when I was a senior in college um, and I had to drop out. I was a single mom for a long time. Um, I, you know, was in an abusive relationship and I had to take him to court to get a protection yeah. order. Like all of these, you know, I didn't have the support of my family. I, you know, um, you know, there's just, there's just, I didn't start my career uh, really. I mean, I, I started in wellness when I, in, in the year 2000, but I didn't start my career really until 2009. And I was 39 years old. Mm -hmm. So I've done things so much differently that it's given me a different perspective because my mom is one of those people who did everything, you know, just right and has been miserable her entire life. Yeah. Uh, and so it scared the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. I just was like, I'm never, I, if that's what it means to do things a certain way, I'm not doing that. So <laughs> But, you know, I think that, right, we, we make assumptions based on our experiences, based on society. Yeah. Um, but also, I just, I do think it's really interesting that we base our assumptions on what we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people do that with a plant-based diet. They mm -hmm. assume that it's, de that it's depriving. Yep. They assume that the food doesn't taste good. They assume that, um, you know, oh, you're not going to get enough protein. They're going to assume all these things because that enables them to stay where they're at. Mm -hmm. and, it, and so for some people, they hear me giving out the correct information. They're like, oh, I, okay, great. I didn't realize that you get plenty of protein. I didn't realize the food was amazing. Like, but for other people, they allow those things to keep them stuck because it, mm -hmm. that means they don't have to move. They don't have to move forward. <clears throat> and I think mm -hmm. there's um, someone in our, our group is a really perfect example of not making this assumption. Um, we have someone in the group who she started last year. She immediately lost about 40 pounds. And she said uh, to us right away that she's, she's like, my family's not on board with us. Nobody in my, she hung out with her family of origin. And then also she has a child and her husband and, and she's like, nobody is doing this but me. So she lost 40 pounds and, um, she just, but she, she made the assumption that her family would never get on board. Well, her husband just had a, uh, a heart attack and had to have an emergency triple bypass. And so she was putting in the group today I'm transitioning my whole family to plant-based. So this is some, you know, her family was like, never, we're never, ever doing this. And now they're like, okay, now we're going to do this. because. Right. And so I think the women that make the assumption that their family is never going to get on board and it's going to be too hard to do it on their own. You know, you look at somebody like her and she's she lost 40 pounds without anybody around her Right. Just supporting her at all. And then now, because they see what's happened with her and they see what's happened with them, they're ready to get on board. Mm -hmm. right. So it goes back to what Brittany says. You can either assume the worst or assume the best, mm -hmm. you know? And I just think she's a really good example of someone who didn't assume I can't do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And now because of what she's done, her family is going to be healthier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how, um, what do you think has changed in your thought process about making assumptions, not just, so with both things, with your, your health, and then also in your relationships and your dealings with other people? Yeah, I don't, I really do want to think the best of people because, you know, all my life, I wanted people to think the best of me. And so I'm going to give that as a fair shake with somebody else. My assumptions was always directly related to my own 
thought pattern. And it was always a negative that I couldn't. It wasn't somebody else. It was always with me. So I have totally switched that. And how I've done that is that I've immersed myself into this positivity in this group and my mindset and my mantras, things that I tell myself. And I have just believe it. And I have just set myself up and I said, I can do this today because the present is a gift. I wasn't borrowing yesterday's trouble. I'm not looking ahead to tomorrow and all the things that can go wrong because people, listen, we live in a fallen world. People are fallible. People are going to disappoint you. But I was so tired of disappointing myself. And so what I did was I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, but I had the support of this group and I had the positive energy and I had a roadmap that was very clearly laid out for me. And that is what's made the difference. And I can say with certainty that I'm never going back. And I've never said that before from all the years. I've never said, gosh, I hope this is the one that works. You can hear me right now today. I'm never going back because I know what to do. I like where I am in the station too much. I had always kept bigger clothes in my closet all of these years, just in case. Those are out the door. I got rid of those a while back because, you know, I'm not going back to that. There's no need in that. And you know how wonderful it is to trust yourself with that certainty. That's the thing is trusting yourself, you know, with every other thing that I did. And I talk a lot about how I yo-yo dieted for decades. Yes. I would always say, I hope this. I hope. And I hope Mm -hmm. this fix. And let me white knuckle it. Right. In the back of my mind, I'd be like, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. I'm good. I'm going to mess this up and something's, you know, going to happen. And, you know, so the fact that I, you know, and, and that's, that is the thing you get in, you know, that you hear so often from the women that, that we all work with is that they feel so confident in themselves. Like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm never, this is, I feel too good. I'm never going back. And they're not afraid. Right. So, and they have a whole group lifting them up and they're right there. And that's not to say you're not going to have bad days because some days you will, but you know what, you're going to be, you're going to be supported and encouraged and you're going to be lifted up. And so it's, it gives you enough stamina to, to, you know, face anything head on. And you really feel like you can fly when you have support. And I know Joanne just posted a picture of about seven big bags of clothes that she got. (laughs) So big bags of big clothes. <laughs> they are yeah. Gone. So, yeah. yeah. So tell us your thoughts on that. Well, I think a lot of it comes from, like you said, not being confident in yourself. Mm-hmm. And when you make assumptions, I think a lot of times we make assumptions out of fear because we're just, you know, we just live in that, that society of, not being able to meet expectations like we failed so many times because the system is set up for us to fail I think that that has really crashed a lot of people's confidence and we're afraid to take up space you know we're afraid to let our own thoughts and our own needs be met and we're afraid to ask for that and I, I think like like what LT said like when we are together in this group, we can move forward full speed ahead. And it was funny you said that because this morning I was thinking about all this, thinking it's, you know how you make analogies all the time? Well, that's kind of how my brain works too. I was thinking, have you ever seen those crazy videos where I don't know what country it's in, probably in a lot of other underdeveloped countries where there's like an intersection and there's like five points coming at it. There's motorcycles, there's trucks, there's nobody knows what to do. So you're just kind of all like, go forward and stop because you're just, you're waiting to see what everybody else does. And you, you, so you can't just go through the intersection. You have to pause, 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 and wait to see what other people are going to do. Well, you compare that to like Germany with the Autobahn, the rules are in, in place. Everybody stays in their lane because they're confident that the system works and that the system, so those people are flying at 110 miles an hour and they're all moving forward together because they know that the system works. They know they're confident. They have the confidence that I'm in my lane. I don't know what your lane is. You know, you guys have your own lanes. This is my lane. I'm confident to move forward. And I feel like that's what happens in our group. We're, We're surrounded by other people 
who are building their own confidence and we move forward together mm -hmm. and we're not afraid of it. We're not afraid to take up our own lane anymore. Yeah, that's just such a great analogy, I think, because that is true that women are afraid to take up space. They're mm -hmm. afraid to voice something that might conflict with something someone yeah. else has to say. They, are, they, you know, I, I talk to a lot of women who, um, you know, I'm going to be doing, if you guys have not seen this, I'm going to be doing a talk on self-worth next week. Uh, because it's something that I see over and over again, uh, women not valuing themselves mm -hmm. and it's showing up in all different aspects of their life in negative ways. And, you know, uh, a lot of them will say things like um, they're prioritizing taking care of other people instead of themselves. You know, like I, I had a woman last week say, well, you know, I we're kind of strapped right now because, um, you know, my, my husband uh, had a heart attack. And so I've been doing, you know, doing more um, to make up for the time that he was off work. And I was like, oh, so you guys really both need to do this. She goes, oh no, he's not going to change his diet. I mean, so it's like, she's wanting to get healthy, but she's being held back by mm -hmm. someone who is mm -hmm. just determined to destroy his own health and take her down with him. And, and that's mm -hmm. the thing is, I hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hear, you know, well, my kids are in three different sports and we pay all this money for that. And I can't, you know, it's, it's always has to do with, I'm doing for other people. Yeah. And therefore I can't do for myself, even though I've gained 50 pounds and my health is in the crapper and I'm not happy. I'm still, you know, they'll say, well, I talked it over with my husband and we just agree that this isn't a good investment right now, you know, for me. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you're telling me how awful you feel every day. So what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. I, I'm just going to try to do it on my own. And so it's like, I hear this a lot because uh -huh. then I'll hear, hear from them like a year later that they're still in the same spot because this is what we do. But part of that is us not being willing to just say, listen, I'm doing a lot to take care of everybody in this family. I'm doing a lot, you know, I'm, I'm working or I'm, you know, all the things that you're doing and saying, I, I need something for myself. Mm -hmm. too. And I, yeah. so that is, is a big part of why I wanted to do that talk, which is on Tuesday, but also it has to do with what we're talking about today, because these are societal assumptions that you are going to do it all and look good doing it or you have failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a lot of pressure. And Too so much. it's, no, it's, it's no wonder that people who just go into it, women who just go into it to want to lose weight and they're not dealing with all the crap that is coming down the pipeline at them, that it doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So how are I, how would you say the two of you have more courage now to take up space? What is that looking like in your life? Like you said, Joanne, we could see it in our group, but in your, mm -hmm. in your life with the people in your life, mm -hmm. how are you by um, taking up your own space? And what is that mm -hmm. showing up like? For me, it's showing up as not just happiness, but joy, because there's a difference. And this is a contentment because my brain is not being overtaken by all of the junk. Oh, how do I look? Oh, what else should I say? Oh, I don't, why did I wear this? Why did I even come? I'm not even thinking all that anymore. I'm showing up because I feel confident in how I present myself. And all that baggage is gone. I'm, I'm wearing sizes that I want. I'm, you know, I'm, I feel great my numbers are terrific at the doctor. So, I mean, all these things have happened. So it's given me such internal confidence about things and that radiates off of you, that positivity radiates, you know, people are drawn to you because of that, because I just don't have this little slump of think of, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, ho -hum. you know, yeah. the way I used to be, or even if I even went, because there was a time where I isolated a lot. So, you know, when you, when you present yourself in a positive manner, people are drawn to that. And that's the way, that's really my authentic self. 
that's always who I've been. I just had her buried for a while. So it has been wonderful to reconnect with that because that is really who I truly am at my core. And you told me, you, you told us that people have actually commented on that. They see you differently. They see me you're showing up differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very yeah. cool. And you've even been able to talk to your daughter about that as well. Yes, we talk about that a lot because she's about to go off to college in the fall. And, you know, I really want her to have that confidence and making those choices and good choices and how when you can go down a bunny trail of some bad choices and wind up in a place that you really don't want to be. And so if, if as long as you have that awareness ahead of time and you can stay plugged in with that and, you know, the really the sky's the limit right. for somebody that, that's going in with the right kind of mindset. Right. Especially if you can start thinking this way. I know we've all talked about this when you're younger. Like if oh my you had gosh. this mindset when Listen, you were younger. This Brittany, who's 31, almost 32, I told her, I said, I think I speak for most of the group that we would have loved to have had this awareness mm -hmm. at your age. Right. Yes, for sure. Because let me tell you, that life would have been a whole lot different if I was thinking like Brittany is thinking at 31. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. I can't yeah, imagine. 51. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. But hey, that's the, that's the great thing is that now, you know, we can have an amazing second act. Gosh, um, I know it. That we and did you not. Got the see. wisdom. You've got the right. experience. You have a deep appreciation because you've been through the trenches. Yes. So you're right. It's never too late to start. And that's a that's a bunch of wish talk. You know, gosh, we wish we had. But you're right. This is a perfect time in this age because you have the best of both worlds. You still have the youth. You can have the vitality. But then you can have all that wisdom and experience to back it up with too. So true. And Gina says, this is the best investment I did for myself and not holding back and just taking care of myself now. Everything is just getting better. Every week I lean, learn so much from all of you. I want to thank Lori for having the group and thank coaches Joanne and LT. So, yeah. Um, so what about you, uh, Joanne? I forget. What was the question I asked? <laughs> <laughs> we like went off on a tangent and I was like wait what did I say um the I, I was talking about courage how it's showing up in your life um yeah yeah mm -hmm. I think it's I've I've gone back to being my authentic self and for so many years I wasn't and I think that was you know we we talk about this all the time the change has to start in here and and it's not every it comes from a lot of all the stuff coming at you but if you don't change what's in here and get right um in in your own self and your own thoughts you're never going to be able to move forward and so you know I I used to be I, at least I think and some of my friends might agree I used to be fun I used to be <laughs> crazy I used to be the life of the party kind of you know like the the class clown and and I was fearless. I used to be really, I was the stupid one in high school who would go and do the stupid things, but that's who I am. That's who I authentically am. And then it came to a screeching halt. It came to, and, and I think that's where my conflict came in because I wasn't living authentically. I was stifling myself so much for the fear of saying the wrong thing or looking the wrong way or doing, making the wrong choice. Who cares if you make the wrong choice? That's how we learn. Who cares mm -hmm. if you say the wrong thing? You know, that's mm -hmm. sometimes the wrong thing comes out. And if you're being yourself and you're coming at it, like you said, from a place of love, instead of from a place of like, I don't know, I don't know what it was, but it was a defense mechanism that I put mm -hmm. in place where I just didn't trust my authentic self anymore. And, and now that I have unraveled all of that and unlearned all of that garbage and I'm authentic I think I show up a lot differently with even just my immediate family they don't just you know nobody's walking on eggshells I don't think anymore they're not mm -hmm. like what like LT said what what are we going to walk into what mood is she going to be in <laughs> right. I'm going to be in the mood I was born to be in and that's what you're always going to expect now and, right. and you're not it's not it's not one extreme or the other. It's because I feel whole and I feel content and I don't, I don't worry about what other people are going to think, you know, mm -hmm. I'm just myself. 
And I think that allows everybody else to be themselves and everybody else to mess up. You know, when, when other people, when you're afraid to mess up, everybody around you is afraid to mess up. And how are they going to learn? That's what life is about is Mm -hmm. making mistakes and learning from them. And if we can all just quit being fearful and just move forward, I think, you know, that's, that's how I feel like I'm showing up now. And it's, it's effortless, you know, it's so much less exhausting it is. than trying to live, to hop through all those loops you, all the time. You know, these thoughts that ran through our minds, especially my, I mean, I just ruminated on them and it really yes. just puts you into a whole series of being inactive on things yes. because you just cannot even get out of it. And it's then it crippling. just compounds over the years and my gosh Mm -hmm. and then before you know it you've looked up and it's been several years and you're like who am I yeah but that's that's, such a relief to have that gone yeah it's it is it's a really it's a huge and it's funny because like LT said and like a lot of people probably think to make this change is hard but it's 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 hard for like three weeks and then (laughs) because you're learning something different but once you, once you get rid of all that other stuff that was weighing you down, it's like a big sigh of relief. Oh, and, and then yeah. nothing's hard anymore because you're just living your life the way you were meant to live it. And all that other garbage is gone. So it's, it's really not hard. Thinking about change is hard, but it's yeah. not hard on the other side of it. It's, it's, well, it's effortless. Like you said, it's you, it's years and years of things being difficult and we get so overwhelmed that we feel too overwhelmed to get out of it. That's yeah. It. Mm-hmm. And so it seems so much bigger yeah. than it actually is. Right. Mm-hmm. Once you get started and you see that there's a step-by-step process to it and you have all the support, then it's like, okay, you know, I can do this. Yeah. And then- yeah like you said, it becomes like everything else. It's a new habit. It's a new way mm-hmm. of learning. And then it's like, oh, okay, now I know the choices I need to make. And it's, you know, and you start to just also unload the judgments. Yeah. Like, like you said, it's really, you know, not only the judgments, the problem is we put judgments on ourselves. Yeah. And so then we put judgments on other people. Mm-hmm. It's a defense mechanism because, well, I'm not so bad if I compare myself to this person and mm-hmm. they're worse than me. And so we start making a hierarchy in our mind about that. Mm-hmm. And when you can be really comfortable with yourself, you just don't feel the need to do that. Right. Your yeah. grass is green enough that you don't feel like, oh, I've got to compare myself to whatever is going on with everybody else. And mm-hmm. it does make you so much, um, your energy is so much better. People can mm-hmm. sense that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beauties of being a coach with you and Joanne. And I know we both agree on this. We love seeing other women get these successes and there's no jealousy there. As a matter of fact, we're the biggest cheerleaders that you're ever going to see. And that brings us great joy and contentment Mm -hmm. when we see somebody (laughs) coming into their own. There's really nothing like it. I mean, we did it for ourselves, but to see somebody else do it, it's, it's fun every time. Mm -hmm. It is it's exciting to be a part of that um, transformation and that energy, because just like with Brittany, it's never just, oh, you know, I think, you know, with these other things that your people are doing, Beachbody and all this different stuff, you know, it's like, oh, it's all about the number that's on the scale. And, and we, and of course that's important. I mean, your, your weight is a marker of how well, what your health Mm -hmm. is like. So we, you know, that's definitely part of it but just like with Brittany and with the other women if you've been you know watching us um, as we've done this show for 32 episodes you've seen quite a few of the women come on it is it's not just the weight and that's the really exciting part is when you have people like we had someone we do a non-scale victory day every Friday Mm -hmm. and that is my favorite day because Mm I weigh a day is great I love seeing people make that kind of progress but non-scale victory day is amazing because we had someone come in there today and she goes, I stood up for myself and it was so mm-hmm. invigorating. Yeah. And I <laughs> said, watch out girl. Cause it is addictive. And she yeah. was like, yes. So these are the things that we're seeing in the group that are so exciting. Mm-hmm. And that when you actually undertake this type of process that you will see for yourself and, mm-hmm. um, you know, 
it does take courage to undertake the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, but it's absolutely worth it. It's Mm -hmm. absolutely worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't imagine where I would be if I had not. Mm -hmm. It's more than worth it. And it's a very minimal investment. If you think about it, I'll speak for myself. To me, it really was a minimal investment to have a lifetime membership in a group where you're going to get not only a coach, but coaching calls and all kinds of other things just coming your way. And you think, my gosh, think of all the money. I spent a lot, a lot of money on a lot, a lot of programs that kept me frustrated and messing up. At one point, I was spending $1,200 a month on a family of five on food. (laughs) Yes, on food. Because we're eating, eating, yeah, because we're eating out so much. And if I think about how much money I wasted on killing myself. That's it. mm -hmm. And my family. Like, so that's the other thing is I hear a lot of women, they're like, well, I don't want to deprive my kids just because I'm eating this way. It's not depriving. It's helping them to learn to eat healthy, Mm -hmm. which they need. They need that. They're, they're right. going to be adults and you don't want them to go down that same path. Um, and, and so it's delicious food, my gosh. I mean, your husband's a chef. You come up with all kinds of recipes. <laughs> I mean, it we're really eating good and we're eating is. a very varied diet. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's an assumption that a lot of people make is that it's not good. And in a prime example, I will tell you right now, as we speak, my mother is at the doctor. I got a text from her this morning. She is at the doctor. They are testing her A1C. Um, they, they tested her like last week or the week before. Now that's a, it's a, the second test of it. And I can, I know my mom lives in fear all the time. Um, and so she, she texted me, she goes, just so you know, I'm at the doctor right now. Um, and I'm getting my A1C tested. And I said, okay, well, don't let it scare you too much because I can help you figure this out. I can help you get it back to normal if you want my help. And that's the other assumption that we make is that people want our help when they don't. So I said, if you're, I said, if you're ready and you want to learn more about it, let me know. But she said, I said, if you want help, I can help you. And she said, what I want is, and I'm not kidding. This is the quote. I want the cakes. I want the baked goods. I want the pastries. And she goes, if you can give me that, then I'm on board. And I was thinking to myself before I responded, because, you know, all the science behind it, I didn't want to go into that, but I thought I eat that stuff. Like I can still eat baked goods. I can still eat sweet things, but I do it in a way that helps my body instead of going to Costco and buying the cheesecake every week. You know, like I can still, she assumes that I don't enjoy my food. She assumes that to be healthy means you can never have food that tastes good or, Mm -hmm. you know, like people assume that that's, I eat lettuce all the time. I don't eat (laughs) lettuce all the time. No. Yeah, that, that's so true. They, they, I used to eat all kinds of crap and I have found with this way of living that if I have a craving for something, then I can make it according to, I can make a plant-based version that's delicious. I mean, Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Chef John's ribs, I may or may not have been eating those cold out of the fridge. <laughs> we won't tell. <laughs> just that. Right. Uh, That's I mean, the thing. Just... it's not one set of food. It's not that food and this food. It's all, that's what, that's what a lot of people have that hang up, you know, that they, well, when I get back to eating normal, well, like, this is normal. Yeah. This is our normal and it, and it's right. a good normal and it's the way you should be in your organs and your heart <laughs> are going to thank you for it. Your digestive system is going to thank you for it. Your cholesterol, your blood pressure numbers are going to thank you for it. Right. You know, that's the way I look at it. This is my normal. I don't say, yeah. well, that, when that, you know, the I, way. And, right. Yeah. Every other like way of eating, like something like keto, you're always thinking to yourself, well, I'm going to do this for a while. And right. then when I lose the weight, yes. I'll be able to go back to normal. Then you gain That's all your exactly weight back. Right. And it's such a weird thought process right. that we go through. And I would say too, with your mom, Joanne, that it's exactly what we're talking about. Not only does she make that assumption mm-hmm. just based on her personal experience, which I mean, not that she has any eating plant-based, but just on maybe things she's seen or read or assumed, but also because she doesn't want to change her ways. And so no, it's she absolutely doesn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. 
it's just easier to think that way when you mm-hmm. are yeah. addicted to the food. Yes. That you mm-hmm. Whereas my mom did want to change her ways right. and has changed her ways and is reaping the benefits at almost 82. That's right. amazing. That's and the she's probably she's healthier than my mom and my mom's <laughs> right. in her sixties. So, yeah. you know, it can be done. It's not that your mom, you know, is any different than any other woman. It's just, no. you make a choice. And if you do it, that's right. You reap the rewards. My mother wanted to feel better. She was tired of eating that type of food that was literally making her sick because mm-hmm. she was living in a retirement community and was eating what was served. And they had lots of little snacks and desserts and mm-hmm. all that. And it just really made her sick. I'm talking about sick in the bed, sick. Yeah, and she's turned all that around. And now she's one of the more active ones out there. Well, and men make the same assumption. They will assume that eating plant-based makes you weak or, mm-hmm. is, I, I, you know, and the thing is the strongest man in the world, like literally like Olympian, the strongest yeah. man for powerlifting is a vegan. Yeah. Right. And the, like my husband, when he went plant-based, he gained weight. He actually, he was underweight when I met him eating the standard American diet. And so he gained weight and now looks like a normal, you know, person. Whereas before I would be saying to him, like, you know, you are way, way too thin. He was five when he and I met, he's almost six feet tall. He weighed 155 pounds. Yeah. So he's put on a good, at least 25, I'm um, going plant-based and he just looks normal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, people make assumptions, you know, um, that, they, they don't have any basis in fact and are just based on s- the way society thinks. Yeah. yeah, and they make assumptions that tofu doesn't taste good either when we know that it's a blank slate and can be turned into absolutely anything. Yeah. But they had it once in college and hated it. Well, okay. That was me. I had it once in college. It was disgusting. And sure. it was because I had it. It was, they, they didn't call it tofu back then. They called it soy curds. And I was like, I remember my, my friend, it was so funny because my friend was like this major hippie who had grown up, her parents were vegetarian and everything. And so we went out, um, we went to eat at like a, a Chinese place and she ordered this and I'm like, what the hell is that? Like I grew up <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere, like in the cornfield. I was like, what is this stuff? And, and she's like, oh, it's, oh, it's bean curd. That's what it was. Bean she's curd. Like, oh, it's bean, bean curd. curd. And I was like, okay. She's like, you want to try it? And I'm like, sure. You know, and I tasted it. It was like nothing. It was like nothing in my yeah. mouth. And yeah. it was mushy. And I was like, no, this is, yeah. why, why would you eat this? And she liked it. Uh-huh. Um, but then, you know, so years later, um, many years, I went after I became plant-based, I still didn't eat tofu because I just assumed I didn't like it. But when I finally started, you know, I was like, all right, I'm going to experiment with this. And I was like, basically anything that you flavor it with is what it tastes like. So I'm like, all right, tofu with sure. barbecue, tofu with peanut sauce, to- you know, it's like delicious. Yeah. And so yeah, you, know, it's just, you just got to know how to make it. But yeah, yeah, it's, it is that same thing. It's just opening your, your thinking uh-huh. up. But it's just the assumption. We get this all the time because, you know, we have lost a significant amount of weight, the three of us. So when we get seen out in real life, it just happened to me yesterday. Somebody said, oh, my gosh, you have lost the weight. And I said, well, I have. Well, what what is, well, I'm doing plant-based. Oh, I could never do that. Where do you get your protein? That's the first thing they said. I hate tofu. I can't eat tofu. You know, they, they make all these assumptions, but yet they're giving you all these compliments and seeing how you, you're, you're different and all the way, but immediately I can never do that. And I said, well, listen, I said the same thing too, but, um, but once you really get in there and start, it's all in how you prep, it's all in how you fix things. It's, it's all in what you really, what you really want, ultimately want. And, you know, that's why I don't, don't ever shut things, uh, give something a chance, give it an honest chance. It's, it's going to be better than you think this, this program is, I can tell you, because I have a lot of programs to compare it to. And that <laughs> comes back to exactly what Brittany said of just assuming the best. That's the self-fulfilling prophecy is going right. into something, assuming yeah. this is going to work for me. This sure. is different. This is, you know, scientifically sound. This is exactly, exactly what I need. And it as what? such manifest yeah. it. Right. Yeah, because if you go into something and are immediately like, oh, this is too hard, no matter what it is, if this is, this mm-hmm. is too hard, whatever it is, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever the thing is, then you're not going to succeed no matter what. Mm-hmm. And so that's the other thing is just, you know, 
um, that's really all manifesting is, is visualizing what you want for yourself and right. putting your, yeah. Um, Emily says manifest and visualize, visualize what you want for yourself and, you know, assume yes. that you can make that happen and that the universe has your back. Yes. And when you see opportunities, they will start cropping up and take them as they are and say, thank you for yeah. this gift, because I see this opportunity. Right. And I mean, take it with both hands. Right. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I love what Brittany said about if you're here listening to this, you're supposed to be here because I, I hear that from women all the time. They're like, I don't know where I even found you. <laughs> right. I just, I was, I yeah. was praying about this or I was hoping for this. And there you were like, I yep. think that the universe really does work that way if yes. you're paying attention for all of us. Yes, I felt the same way the, the minute I met you and talked to you. I got a different vibe from minute one and I mm -hmm. ran with it and I've never turned back from it. Mm -hmm. Yep, I did the same thing. And I think this has been the first time in my entire life where I wasn't afraid to let myself, to let my guard down. That yep. was the thing with me. I, I was so had my wall up so much that I was afraid to let my guard down. So I couldn't move forward. I was stuck mm -hmm. right in, in anger and resentment. And I was stuck there because I would never allow myself to let that guard down to learn. And it was really uncomfortable for me in the beginning because to let that guard down, it was painful and it was scary. But once I did, each little time I let my guard down and let you get in my head and go, well, here's what you need to do. Just try this. And I was like, oh, that seems really out of my comfort zone. <laughs> but there was something that I just automatically trusted because I, I saw what was happening in the group. I was uh -huh. like, okay, oh, I'm going to trust this. And I did. And then that got reinforced. And I was like, oh, that felt kind of good. Right. That's actually taking me a step forward. And then I did that again. And then I did that again. Oh, and that's why the people that do the mindset work get a lot farther than the people who don't do the mindset work, because exactly. you have to allow yourself to change. And, and that can be scary, but it's not it as is. scary as it's liberating. Stuff. Listen, it is anybody that's watched me on this show thinks, well, my gosh, I know everything about her because she's an open book <laughs> and I am an open book. But if you had known me <laughs> by pride, I was secretive. I kept things hidden. Um, I lied to myself. I lied by omission. I lied to other people. I kept my little world small and I didn't tell a lot of what was going on with me privately. Now I'm just like, hey, here it is. Everybody want to know something? Just ask. But you know, nobody's been more surprised than me and, than that doing that. But this program has allowed me to have that freedom yeah. and that confidence and that support to go forward doing it. And now I'm the better because of it, because mm -hmm. I listen, it is liberating to dump truck all that stuff off. And yeah. if it can help anybody, then that's totally worth it. Well, mm -hmm. I feel like it's exactly, it's what my Angelo said, that every time a woman stands up for herself, she unknowingly stands up for all other women. Yeah. Yes. Right. And so when we're in this tight knit group where women are seeing us take those chances yeah, and yeah. they, it gives you permission to mm -hmm. do it because you see someone else doing it. And that's, yeah. that's why, you know, um, Hillary's comment today that I stood up for myself, like that's huge. It's that big. is a huge thing for her. And she's doing it because she sees other people in the group saying these same types of things. Mm -hmm. And when you see other people moving forward and you see the support happens, even though they may not be doing it perfectly, mm -hmm. then it gives you the opportunity to be authentic and to move forward, even if you make mistakes, you yeah. know? Sure. Um, and so, you know, I, um, I was complaining to, uh, to you, Joanne, about um, seeing that there were other coaches. I, I saw, this is a trend. I'm always dismayed by trends in the, uh, in the coaching industry. Um, the trend right now is breakthrough session. Okay. So a breakthrough session is you spend four or five hours with a coach, you pay somewhere between five and $10,000 and it's a life changer. Right. Mm. And so when I first, I, one of the coaches that I actually like um, put this out there and I was angry because I thought, 
how, how, how are you, this is somebody who's on my level. This is not, this is, we're not talking about Glenn and Doyle or somebody here. This is like, <laughs> I, you know, and I was like, how are you coming up with this number? How are you coming up with this number to charge people? And how can you guarantee these kinds of results? And so it was, I was angry at first. And then I realized that these are people who you, you pay for this one session with her, but she's not, that's one day. And after that, you don't talk to her unless you pay again. Mm -hmm. The thing that is what we're doing differently here is we wade in there with people for the long term. We're mm -hmm. not saying, hey, if you don't have a transformation in this one day, then I don't know, I guess make another appointment. We are, right. these are relationships. We are in it for the long haul, whether, you know, and that's the great thing about, you know, being in this program for more than a day or for three months mm -hmm. or whatever you were in with these other things is that somebody like Brittany who lost all of her weight to start, but then still two years later is still working on her mindset, mm -hmm. still moving forward. It's affecting her career. It's affecting her relationships. This is what we're doing in the group. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's exciting to me. Um, it is. is we get to see these long-term changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And light bulb moments can happen at various stages. They don't have to always happen in the first two weeks. They can, right. you're right. I still get right. light bulb moments. Right. Mm -hmm. still. Me too. That's the, that's the great thing. And then we're, because we're all here talking about it. Yeah. yeah. That is encouraging <laughs> everyone who's listening, even people who are just lurking <laughs> behind the scenes mm -hmm. and aren't commenting or, you know, um, engaging that much, you know, that is helping them. We're standing mm -hmm. up for ourselves and that's helping other women to stand up for themselves as well and claim their space. Like you said, mm -hmm. Joanna. Mm -hmm. um, well, we really appreciate everyone who was here for this discussion today. Uh, we will be talking next week about the final agreement or the fourth agreement, which is, um, I just lost it. What is it? Always doing your best. Always, Always do your best. best. Yep. Always do your best. Um, and we'll so, have Molly. And we will have, yes, Molly, who is another great example. She is a teacher um, who uh, lost a, a considerable amount of weight to beginning at the beginning of the program. And then she kind of just maintained, she wasn't at her goal yet, but she maintained because she was losing it during COVID, but she yeah. maintained that whole time. Mm -hmm. And now that that is starting to, you know, break up a little bit. We are, she's, she's making progress again. And so um, she stayed true to herself through a very, very difficult time. And so that's going to be a great conversation as well. So I really yeah. hope that anyone you are always, as you know, this is a free group. You're welcome to invite anyone to join that you would like, and they can definitely do that. Um, and uh, please tune in for uh, my talk on self-worth next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That will be live streamed into the group. So I would love it to be a discussion as well as recorded. So um, thank you everybody for watching. Have an amazing weekend and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.